UC San Diego. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, I do want to point out that I am a principal investigator and a consultant for Sarepta Therapeutics who does natural history studies and gene therapy in this space. All right, program obje objectives are to recognize the new classification and clinical features of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, review diagnostic process and how to resolve VUSs, explore recent advances in clinical studies, and then um, we're gonna show you some additional tools and resources that you can use to help with the diagnosis and VUS resolution at the end. Program agenda actually follows a very similar pathway with classification, clinical, di clinical manifestations, diagnosis, genetics, and treatment um, as it stands right now for limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So limb girdle muscular dystrophy, LGMD, is a very heterogeneous group of diseases that is fundamentally characterized by weakness in the shoulder and pelvic girdle. Patients were previously classified into dominant limb girdle muscular dystrophy and, and recessive limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and the dominants were known as LGMD1s and recessives were LGMD2s. Moving forward, as of 2018, the new nomenclature is to call it LGMD dominant, so LGMD-D, or LGMD recessive, LGMD-R. There is, like I had said, there's quite a bit of genetic heterogeneity, meaning there are mutations in two different genes that can actually cause a very similar phenotype. For example, sarcoglycan gamma and alpha pathogenic variants can actually cause very similar phenotype and it might be indistinguishable just based on clinical history and exam. Also, limb girdle muscular dystrophy is characterized by genetic pleiotropy. What that means is that you can have mutations in different genes that cause a similar phenotype. The, the, the case that comes to mind right away is dysferlin mutations, which cause the, the distal myopathy version of um, dysferlin, which is historically referred to as Miyoshi myopathy, can also look very similar to anoctamin 5 variants and the way that those patients present. The epidemiology of limb girdle muscular dystrophy is actually quite different from region to region. The worldwide prevalence is estimated to be between 0.8 and 6.9 cases per 100,000. So if you were to use the worldwide prevalence in the United States, that could be as low as 2,800 cases to as high as 24,000 cases. The actual prevalence of patients with limb girdle muscular dystrophy in the U.S. is unknown. We have some data from various regions of the United States, but because we're a melting pot, we're probably somewhere in the middle. Some of you know that, for example, Fukutin related, sorry, Fukutin um, limb girdle muscular dystrophy has a higher prevalence in Japan, uh, kind of can tell based on the name. So there are certain types of limb girdle muscular dystrophy that happens in higher prevalence in certain parts of the globe. Both sexes are affected equally. This is typically an autosomal, these are autosomal diseases. The onset of weakness varies considerably. It can be as young as childhood um, and as old as, as a middle-aged adult, roughly 50 years of age. Of note, limb girdle muscular dystrophy is typically not infantile. If a gene within the limb girdle muscular dystrophy space is infantile, we often give it a different name. Um, for example, collagen 6, if it's an infantile onset, we typically call, call it collagen 6-related um, muscular dystrophy, historically referred to as Ulrich. We don't typically that give that patient limb girdle muscular dystrophy as a diagnosis. There are some, there are some forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy that can be quite severe and can result in loss of ambulation. And there are other forms that can allow the patient to ambulate well into late adulthood. And similarly, some of these subtypes can actually result in considerable limitations in mobility. There are significant impacts on the patient's quality of life as well as the care burdens, caregiver's burden stemming from that limited mobility. So um, the new nomenclature separates 
limb girdle muscular dystrophy as dominant versus recessive. The recessive is a whole lot more common. It's actually about 90% of all cases compared to the dominant ones. There are 24 subtypes for the recessive and only five currently for the dominant. The age of onset for the recessive is often earlier than dominant and is childhood to young adulthood, childhood, adolescent, and young adulthood for, for the recessive. Whereas for the dominant, it tends to be a little bit more variable and it's a little bit later onset, mostly adolescent and late adulthood. The limb weakness, the, the degree of severity for the recessive form is moderate, moderate to severe for the recessive where it could be mild to moderate for the dominant. CKs can be markedly elevated for the recessive limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So it can be as high as 30,000, almost like it's approaching a Duchenne-like number. Um, in fact, when I was in training, I was taught that if you see something that looks like Duchenne, but in a girl, think of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So when the CK is about um, it's multiple thousands, especially if it's over 10,000, think more recessive. For the dominant, it tends to be a little bit lower in the several thousand to approximately a thousand. The recessive diseases progress at a much faster clip than the, than the dominant, and it often requires um, aid, mobility aids such as walkers and power chairs um, for mobility. So what is the main distinction between the new classification and the old classification? First of all, patients with limb girdle muscular dystrophy need to have a limb girdle pattern of weakness. So it needs to be the pelvic and shoulder girdles that are disproportionately involved. And um, so that, that eliminated some patients where the phenotype is mostly restricted to just distal muscles. Second, um, there, there are some other, it needs to look dystrophic under the muscle, um, under light and electron microscopy. This eliminated some of the myofibrillar myopathies, which have a different morphology under the under uh, histology, and they have myofibrillar disarray, and it also eliminated some of the metabolic diseases. So you need to fundamentally have a dystrophic muscle biopsy. Becker muscular dystrophy historically was the one big con condition that was lumped into limb girdle that is no longer part of limb girdle. Becker muscular dystrophy was put into the dystrophinopathies where it, it is, it's more appropriate for it to be in that category. So a desmonopathy, for example, is a myofibrillar myopathy. It is no longer under the new classification system. Similarly, LMNA. LMNA has a huge variation in its phenotype. LMNA variants are actually, have been excluded from the limb girdle muscular dystrophy category. Um, and gene is added, the gene is also added to the name when you declare the, the, the name of the, the disease moving forward. So in this slide, you can see all the recessive conditions in the dark blue, the, the 24 conditions are listed. In the teal are the dominant conditions for limb girdle. So to, to take you through how it's rewritten, what we used to call limb girdle 2A is now limb girdle muscular dystrophy LGMD R1, that's the, and we say calpain 3 related. Similarly, what we used to call 2B is now LGMD R2, dysferlin related. I want to point out some, some patterns. Um, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta are finally in sequence as it should be. I used to do somersaults in my head to try to figure out alpha was D and beta was E. Uh, now they're in order and they're going from R3 to R6. That makes it a tiny bit easier. Um, and then everything else after F, G, H, and I, they're all in order as the previous nomenclature and it just goes on from R6 downward um, in, terms of it, in terms of its correlation. I also want to point out that those of us who have, a, um, have the privilege of taking care of collagen 6 patients, that the later onset collagen 6 patients are actually within the limb girdle classification. Um, collagen 6 can be recessive or dominant, and collagen 6A1, 2, and 3 
historically referred to as Bethlehem myopathy is actually now going to get R22 as and collagen 6 related as its designation. And these are dystrophic on muscle biopsy. Same thing with Marison. There, Marison is caused by an enzyme deficiency in LAMA2. And um, that LAMA2 protein deficiency can be completely absent, at which point it is infantile and it's not called limb girdle, but there's partial deficiency where patients have a pelvic shoulder girdle weakness and they are now classified as R23. Same thing down here where Bethlehem, when it's in the dominant state, is now LGMD D5. I did also want to point out that the most, what will probably end up being the most common limb girdle muscular dystrophy in the United States is actually probably going to be an Octoman 5. Um, so it's now R12. The predominant clinical manifesting feature is weakness. And the weakness, like we have based on the nomenclature, is indeed going to be in the shoulder and hip girdle muscles first. They have the prototypical proximal muscle weakness. They have difficulty raising their arms above their head, like getting a full jug of milk from a top shelf of a refrigerator and bringing it down or even putting it back up. They have difficulty raising their arms above their head to perhaps do their hair, blow dry it, or even wash it. They have difficulty climbing up and down stairs. It's, you actually require more quad strength to climb downstairs than you do upstairs. Running, carrying groceries, getting up off the floor um, becomes more and more difficult with time in limb girdle muscular dystrophy as a whole. And patients will often notice changes in their ability to do sports. They may not be able to sprint off to first base. They may not be able to do endurance exercises like run the mile. They can never get that 15 minute cutoff. They don't ever meet that. They have issues with doing gym class in, in their youth. Look for those types of symptoms when you're evaluating to see when things may have actually started. You might be seeing an adult patient in clinic, but it could actually harken back to quite a few years before they actually think that they had, it actually started. Face is characteristically spared in terms of weakness in limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And the proximal muscle weakness in the legs actually affects the, the back of the thigh, the hamstring muscles, much more than it does the quadriceps in the vast majority of limb girdle muscular dystrophies. This is even true uh, extending down into the lower leg where the back of the lower leg is much more affected than the front of the leg. So the gastroc and soleus is disproportionately affected compared to the tibialis anterior in the vast majority of cases. And then some patients, especially the, the more distal uh, patients who have a much more distal weakness, like the classic Anoctoman 5, they will tell you that when they were trying to reach for something on a top shelf, they realized that they couldn't stand on their toes. Or if they were trying to jump for some reason, maybe they were playing basketball with someone, they, they realized that they can't quite get on their toes to, to jump. So difficulty standing on toes is a symptom that a patient may re recant to you um, if it's one of the distal um, subtypes of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Scapular winging is not at all specific for FSHD. It is actually quite prominent, in, especially in the sarcoglycanopathies. The, some of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies can certainly have some calf hypertrophy, um, especially the sarcoglycanopathies and calpane can have some calf hypertrophy. Cognition is usually spared. And in fact, I encourage my limb girdle muscular dystrophy patients, as I do most of my patients, to really push their academic prowess and to achieve jobs that are computer-based and they can achieve a very meaningful, good quality of life with a, with a job that pays well if they push their academic potential in their youth. Respiratory weakness can happen in limb girdle muscular dystrophy and it's much more common in the recessive forms that tend to be a little bit more severe than the dominant and patients should re receive continual respiratory assessments to determine if they need help with their breathing, especially at night. Diaphragmatic weakness often, diaphragmatic weakness often happens in, especially in the sarcoglycanopathies, the R3 through six, and this is often, can be assessed on a PFT, especially if you're, if you're um, 
center can do supine, sorry, stay, sitting and supine PFTs that can actually show you the, de the degree of diaphragmatic weakness. You can also just assess for a cough. You can ask the patient to cough in your clinic. And if it doesn't sound good, like nice and healthy and deep, then, then that could indicate that if they were to get sick, the probability of them having a, a pneumonia is higher because they simply cannot expectorate their mucus out of their lungs. And, and the mucus can form a nidus for infection. And they might even tell you that they're having difficulty taking breaths, especially if they're flat. So these are symptoms of respiratory weakness that you want to catch earlier rather than later. Cardiomyopathy can happen in specific forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. For instance, the sarcoglycanopathies, the R3 through 6, FKRP especially, and telethonin. Pain, unfortunately, does happen with limb girdle muscular dystrophy and is often because of weakness um, across a specific joint because of imbalances, because one set of muscles across the joint are much stronger than the other counterbalancing set of muscles. Weakness can happen, excuse me, pain can happen across a joint. For instance, um, it can happen across the back because of weakness in the back extensor muscles. It can happen across the shoulder. And um, it can even happen across knees because of the hamstring being a lot weaker than the quad. A lot of pain can happen secondary to immobility. I actually have a number of patients who develop frozen shoulder syndrome because their upper body is so weak that they're, that they're not moving it very much. And you always want to minimize that by giving your patient physical therapy, especially during the pandemic when people couldn't get therapy. I actually had a few patients develop fro frozen shoulder syndrome. Here's one of my patients who has graciously given me permission to show you his, his video. He is a limb girdle muscular dystrophy patient. Um, he is a, um, a, an a, a alpha sarcoglycanopathy. He is mild. And I want to show you how he gets up off the floor. And you can also watch him walk. You can see he's lordotic, his tummy protrudes out. Turn around. He has a Trendelenburg gait, his hip waddles. He's obviously ambulatory and he was able to get up with the minimum push off with his hand. So he has what we refer to as a modified gower. And for how young he is, he probably should be able to get off without any problems, but he does have minor push off that is necessary in order for him to rise from the floor. So he's obviously very mild for what he's got. Is. Um, so to come to the diagnosis of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, first it takes a good thorough history and examination. And on the examination, I especially look for hypertrophy of various um, muscles, especially the calves, for instance. You can look at the tongue as well. But if there's ever hypertrophy, because when we're seeing, for example, an adult patient in our clinic, we're not we're not right away going to limb girdle. We're thinking about other conditions that you can that you need to exclude, such as autoimmune conditions like dermatomyositis, HMG CoA reductase related necrotizing myopathy. Those come to mind when a patient has pelvic and shoulder girdle weakness. So you need to do a careful exam, careful history. If you think that this ends up being genetic, some of the very basic labs that are very meaningful are measuring a CK. And it should be elevated in almost every single limb muscular limb girdle muscular dystrophy as long as it's not end stage. Any patient who has a muscular dystrophy that's end stage can have a normal CK. But if a patient is not end stage, it should be elevated. Um, it should be hubbing at least 1,000. It could be a little bit under 1,000 if it's a very, very mild case. I also try to get historical records to see if there's a, perhaps 10 years ago, if there was a, ever a CK done, that could be a little bit more meaningful than what you're seeing in your, in your patients today. Higher values, of course, can point you more towards the recessive diseases. The next thing that is most meaningful is, to, is electromyography, actually to make sure this is not a nerve disease. I have had my cohort of patients who have proximal muscle weakness with limb girdle distribution that actually ends up being a nerve disease, like a pure motor neuron disease, such as late onset SMA. You want to make sure it's not a nervous disease by doing an EMG and making sure that it's muscle.
And then lastly is a muscle biopsy is often very helpful, um, especially if you actually did the genetic testing first and you have a VUS that you want to resolve, but you can actually get it from the first go, especially if you're wondering if it's an acquired disease. The muscle biopsy shows the prototypical dystrophic changes that you expect to see on muscle biopsy. You can see fiber type vari uh, size variation. You see hypertrophic fibers and atrophic fibers that are more rounded or polygonal as opposed to angular, internal nucleation, profound or mild um, endomesial fibrosis are the hallmark features of muscular dystrophy on a muscle biopsy. And if you're lucky, some of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies can have corresponding immunofluorescence. Unfortunately, not all of them do, but there are some immunofluorescent stains. For example, the sarcoglycans do have immunofluorescent staining, and you can show a reduction in staining to confirm that your patient has that disease or to gather more data that, it, that the disease correlates with the VUS that you have, for instance. I often send genetic testing for limb girdle muscular dystrophy through panels. The panels are now upwards of over 200 genes. There are multiple free or sponsored panels available from multiple different laboratories. And choose one that you think would be easiest to execute in your office. And um, that would be that you have, that you can trust the result from. So there are multiple panels that you can send. It is now often easier to collect than it used to be historically. You can, many of the panels now allow for a buccal swab where you can just collect cheek cells. Um, and then, and there's even a free mail, in, mail back packet within each kit, which makes it extremely easy to actually do these tests in clinic. Getting a genetic, getting genetic confirmation is very important, and it's a necessary step to ending the diagnostic odyssey for these patients. And of course, once you know what the patient's got, it actually, you can help prognosticate. From a specific study um, in 2018, it showed us that the vast majority of limb girdle muscular dystrophies have a lot of VUSs, 72% of the patients in that cohort. And this was collecting data from a large limb girdle muscular dystrophy um, genetic panel. And the cohort of, it was upwards of 4,600 patients, that 72% of them had VUSs. Only 3% had likely pathogenic and 23% had pathogenic variants. Um, so the vast majority of cases of limb girdle were VUSs that require resolution to find out for sure if this is what they've got. So in that regard, once you get genetic testing and you have, you have to contend with the VUS, what do you do? So this is how we think about going through VUS resolution. First of all, if you're lucky enough to have a pattern of inheritance in your patient, let's say you see what, what we think is a dominant pattern of inheritance, then you expect to only find one, you only need one variant for dominant conditions. So you look in your panel and if you have a limb girdle that matches the patient's phenotype, then that is a contender. That VUS is a contender and you only need one variant to actually cause disease. So it's very simple, but if, it's, if, it's, if you're getting a dominant pattern of inheritance, you only need one variant. If it's recessive, then of course you need two variants. So on your panel, if you have, if you have a VUS in a recessive gene, but you don't have a second variant, you need to hunt for that variant, especially if you think that the patient's symptoms fit that specific gene, that recessive gene. So it's possible that a panel can miss a second variant. So I just do the very simple, do I have a dominant disease? Do I have a recessive disease in my hand? And unfortunately, if your patient has no family history, it is really difficult. You don't know if it's a dominant de novo or if it's simply a recessive disease and you just haven't found the second variant. So. If you look at the careful details of the variant analysis, there are some things that you can look at further that can help you determine if that variant is significant or potentially significant. The lab couldn't determine it for you, but you can, you can decide if this is something that is worth further pursuit. For example, the 
the details of the variant will tell you if what the in silico algorithms predict that the variant will do to the protein. For example, and in silico modeling is simply computer modeling of what the variant might do, what this genetic DNA variant might do to the amino acid or to the splicing, um, and, and what that outcome might be. So if the in silico predictions are predicting a, a likely pathogenic, oftentimes they will tell you that is likely pathogenic. It is when one in silico algorithm says that is benign and the other one is indeterminate that you often get a VUS. So, but reading that can help you. And the other one is that you can, you can determine if a variant is very common or if it is very rare in the general population. Most variants, if it's very common, chances are that is not what's causing your patient's condition. If it is very rare, you can hang on to that variant and do further testing. And um, finally, if you have, let's say you actually have one pathogenic and one VUS, and you're thinking of a recessive condition and those, those two variants are in the same gene, you should do segregation analysis. Ideally speaking, you want to you want to test each, each parent of your patient to, to show that each allele was inherited by one parent. Unfortunately, that's not always possible. A parent can be deceased, a parent can be unavailable for testing, and you just do what you can. Even if one parent is unavailable, I still do the one available parent to determine if that parent had one or two of the, the, um, the VUSs. And you may not be able to make a final determination that they're truly in trans versus cis. If it's a recessive disease, you want the two variants to be in trans, one from mom, one from dad. If it is dominant and you have, let's say you have a family history where it's dominant, you have your patient and you have a variant, it might be advantageous if you're able to, to test another manifesting patient, another patient in the family that may not be your patient, um, and if they're manifesting symptoms to demonstrate that the that this variant is present in both individuals, then you are actually getting gathering data that both patients who have a similar or slightly different phenotype, but they're still weak, have carried that dominant variant. You can also have something called a dominant de novo um, mutation, which is where your patient has the condition and your parents don't um, have the condition as a dominant new onset dominant negative disease in your patient. What we do then is you have a dominant variant in your patient and perhaps it's a VUS. You test both parents if available and you demonstrate that they do not carry that VUS and that is why they don't have the phenotype, at which point you can potentially reclassify that variant as a dominant de novo. Finally, this is one reason for doing muscle biopsy is let's say you have a sarcoglycanopathy on your hand, in your hands, and you, one, you have one pathogenic and one VUS. You can do muscle biopsy and show that that specific sar sarcoglycan is lost on the muscle biopsy through immunohistochemical or immunofluorescent staining. Um, this is actually a case of mine where the patient had a gamma psychoglycanopathy R5. And this is what I did. I had, this was actually a homozygous variant and the variant was classified as a VUS and it was a consanguineous family. And what you can see is I sent my patient's muscle biopsy for additional testing through the University of Iowa. These pictures were given to me by my colleague, Dr. Kara Jones. And you have alpha, beta, gamma, and delta sarcoglycan. The first panel is a control sample. You can see very nice bright green in immunohistochemical immunofluorescent staining, highlighting the edges of the muscle cell in all the panels for all the subunits of sarcoglycan. This is sample one taken from my patient, and this is a, a sample two taken from my patient, uh, two different parts of the muscle. And you can see that there's decreased staining of alpha beta, gamma, and delta in, in my patient's 
muscle biopsy. However, I want to point out that the gamma sarcoglycan is profoundly deficient in, in the staining is profoundly deficient in my patient's muscle. And I was contending with two, one variant, a homozygous variant in gamma sarcoglycan. And as a result, if there's a disproportionate lack of staining in gamma sarcoglycan. I did, did confer the patient with the diagnosis of gamma sarcoglycan, um, limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So this is one way of demonstrating that your patient's VUS is consistent with their clinical phenotype and now their histoimmunofluorescent histo staining. There's yet another diagnostic tool that we often don't use in the United States, partly because it's hard to get it authorized, but it's often used in Europe. And that's MRIs of the thigh and lower leg. And I have a little cheat sheet here um, where you can see this is an MRI of the thigh and it's highlighting the different parts of your muscles on a thigh cross section and this is the leg cross section. This is the femur bone, this is the tibial bone and this is the fibular bone. And you can see the vastus lateralis is this curved shaped muscle. So you can see this is the rectus femoris. So you can see the different anatomic placement of the different muscles. So there have been multiple publications showing various MRI patterns of for each limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And I have sh we've shown you the pictures of the most well-characterized types of limb girdle muscular dystrophies. Not all of them, but there are five depicted here. So for example, you can see for calpane, this is the thigh cross-section, this is the leg cross-section. You can see that the posterior compartment of the thigh is extremely involved and the white muscle indicates fat infiltration. Muscle should be nice and dark on these T2 weighted images, these um, stir and T2 weighted images. So the more white it is, the more fat in infiltration there is. This is the corresponding diagram showing you that the posterior compartment of the thigh, these are the various biceps muscles, are disproportionately affected to the quadriceps. Similarly, the, the posterior compartment of the leg, the, the soleus and the gastroc, especially the the lateral gas, the, sorry, the medial gastroc is affected disproportionately in calpane. You can see if you just run your eye across the, across the screen that the posterior compartment is disproportionately white or affected compared to the anterior compartment in all the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, which is a hallmark feature of limb girdle in general. And you can, I would never scan a patient that's late stage for limb girdle. You need to get the patient when, ideally when they're still ambulatory. Um, otherwise, everything will look whited out and fat infiltrated and it's not meaningful to you. You want to catch it early enough to actually be able to separate. MRI is most meaningful because there are some subtle differences. For example, an Octoman 5 has a tendency to affect the quad pretty early, much earlier than the other limb girdle muscular dystrophies. And if there's quite a bit of quad, in, quad involvement and the Anoctoman 5 is a, is a VUS, this muscle, this muscle MRI will, can push you over it to being potentially pathogenic clinically. So that is how MRI is most meaningful. So now let's go over some of the most common forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy in the United States. Here we have calpain. Calpain is a calcium efflux um, it controls calcium efflux across the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Onset is typically in the teens. This is the one that can ca have a lot of scapular winging uh, in addition to the proximal muscle weakness. This CK is not terribly elevated. It's about several thousand. It is, of course, dystrophic. One thing about calpain is that there could be inflammatory cells on the muscle biopsy, and you can show decreased calpain protein on a Western blot. It's, unfortunately, there are other conditions that can secondarily reduce calpain protein on a Western blot. So doing the Western blot analysis is not specific enough, unfortunately. Now let's take another common one, dysferlin R2. This is the condition that used to have um, the subtype also known as Miyoshi myopathy. Miyoshi myopathy, it, 
that's the historical name. Now we actually call it R2. Patients with the distal version of the disease will eventually affect their proximal muscles. And so it's just that they have symptoms further down their leg early on. And this has a fairly classic onset of approximately 18 years. Um, and it, that number hasn't budged. And I have to admit, even in my own patient population, it's a late teenager that almost always, that's when the symptom starts. They might be seeing me later, but it, that's when the symptoms start. And they're pretty good at determining when, when it started affecting their bodies. And this is a, um, a protein that's involved in membrane fusion and repair. This particular condition has an unusual clinical pearl. It actually worsens with aerobic exercise. I actually had a patient tell me that he played basketball and he noticed, and he was doing it very vigorously, and he noticed that over the several years that he played basketball, that his game suffered. And, and he kept trying to play basketball to improve his aerobic capacity and to improve his game and his three-point shooting, but it actually got worse and worse. So you might get that type of story from your patient. This typically has a really high CK, often above 10,000. And um, you can see decreased dystrophin, sorry, I'm gonna say dysferlin protein level and immunostaining on muscle biopsy. R3 through R6 are the sarcoglycanopathies, and this often has onset in childhood and respiratory failure is common, especially after they land in a wheelchair. And this also has very high CKs. This is very dystrophic. And yes, you can do the special immuno immunofluorescent staining to show profound decrease in staining of that specific subunit, although the other subunits can be affected. And then comes FKRP. And, which is a enzyme that's glycos glycosylating alpha dystroglycan. By the way, the sarcoglycans, they are, they are part of the cell membrane, they're proteins on the cell membrane, and they, they, they associate with the dystrophin-associated protein complex. FKRP characteristically has rhabdo. These patients have myoglobinuria, so Coca-Cola-colored urine, especially after exercise, and it could be spontaneous as well, spontaneous rhabdo that happens in their teenage years often. And, and in, later on, the weakness sets in. Respiratory failure does happen, and there is definitely a cardiac component to this, so these patients should be uh, surveilled for cardiac disease. And CK is usually very, very high. And then finally, probably what will end up being our most common subtype of limb girdle in the US is anoctamin 5, it's R12. It's a gene that was described much more recently. Onset is very different compared to the others. These are patients in their middle age, approximately 50 or 40 years of age. It is much slower than the rest, and it is slower, um, sorry, slower than the rest, and it can look very similar to, to what we historically call Miyoshi, which is dysferlin, except these patients are older. And this is the one that can have severe quadriceps atrophy. So they can have a lot of weakness across the knee. They have a lot of muscle pain and rhabdo can happen on occasion. The CK is usually high and is usually several thousand, anywhere from five to 10,000. There are a few patients who have normal CKs and the muscle oftentimes correlate with the CK. It is often dystrophic if the CK is elevated elevated. Unfortunately, there are no disease modifying therapies currently for limb girdle, and these patients are best taken care of in a multidisciplinary setting if they need multiple disciplines. Those disciplines include physical therapy, our physiatry colleagues, those are our rehabilitation and me rehabilitation medicine colleagues, cardiology, pulmonology, sometimes a sleep specialist that could be your pulmonologist or even a neurologist, and then genetic counseling. And our physical therapy and rehab physicians are, are remarkable in getting our patients the necessary devices that they need. Anything from an AFO to a walker to a power chair to um, a Hoyer lift, whatever is needed, is, and they're the ones that actually let our patients function on a day-to-day -day basis.
Cardiac surveillance is important for certain subtypes. This includes the prototypical cardiac surveillance, EKGs, annual echoes, halter monitoring if necessary, and then intermittent cardiac MRIs for specific subtypes. Pulmonary surveillance is just as I said, is PFTs that are often done annually. You especially should start to do this once a patient lands in a wheelchair. And we often recommend that PFTs be, be done in the sitting and supine position. And oftentimes a sleep study is necessary. These patients can have obstructive sleep apnea. And if they're having problems with thinking, if they're having uh, poor sleep and they're sleepy during the day, you need to think of possible nocturnal hypercapnia and they might need bilevel ventilation support. At first, oftentimes it starts at night and it starts to require more and more support during the day. And genetic counseling is imperative because a lot of these conditions are dominant or they're recessive and there is a recurrence risk. And these patients need to be aware of that recurrence risk and genetic counseling is vital in terms of helping patients with family planning, such as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, if that's what your patient wants to pursue. There is one other trial that actually is meaningful in terms of the management of our patient. There is a, a small trial, it's just 25 patients, but it was done in Dysferlin to determine if deflazacort, which is a steroid, can be helpful. And the reason for this was because dysferlinopathy can have inflammatory cells on the muscle biopsy. And the question was, does steroids help, help alleviate or preserve muscle function longer, similar to Duchenne muscular dystrophy? And so a small double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial was done, and it actually showed that deflazacort actually corresponded with slightly worsening muscle strength compared to the placebo group. And there was a laundry list of adverse events that were reported. So as a result, we no longer need to think that steroids could be a potential treatment choice for, the, for dysferlin. So that kind of set that question to uh, set, it, set it down. And that was, it was good that we did this to figure that out. Now comes the exciting part. This is where we talk about some of the specific treatments that are either currently underway or about to get started. Um, for limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Let's start with beta sarcoglycan, which is 2E. There is we're current, um, There are centers in the United States that are currently doing gene replacement for this, but we actually have data from a phase one, two. The current trial that's ongoing is a phase three. And from the phase one, two, which is an open label, non-randomized, single site, first in human study, it was just six patients total. It, um, we have some data. The age range was rather broad, 4 to 15, broad in the sense there's quite a bit of phenotypic difference between a 4-year-old and a 15-year-old, and they did need to have confirmed beta sarcoglycan variants um, in the two different alleles. Muscle weakness that wasn't too strong or too weak, so they needed to be above 40% of normal on their 100-meter walk time test. And that was based on, uh, that was compared to age, height, and weight matched healthy controls at screening. And these patients were given a BD dystrogene Zebaparvovec at either a high dose or a low dose. And there were three patients in each group. <clears throat> um, you can see the high dose is 7.4 times 10 to the 13 vector genomes. And patients were screened on day zero and they got their treatment, and muscle biopsies were done at day zero, 60, and two years. And we have two-year interim results and some safety data. So here were the treatment emergent adverse events. You can see those abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, elevated LFTs, including an elevated GGT, was seen in a large majority of patients. Completely understandable for a gene replacement therapy. Safety profile was overall favorable, and all of these SAEs did resolve with standard therapies like hydration, additional steroids if necessary, anti-nausea meds to help them overcome these symptoms. Um, it did improve. There were no adverse events, sorry, there were no immune-related events, specifically B or C cell, C cell, T cell responses against the virus. And there was also 
or the protein, and there were no antibodies made against that beta sarcoglycan that is now that the patient's now expressing. So that's good. There were no immune mediated reactions that were seen. Here is the data demonstrating that at baseline, patients, um, as you expect, had no vector copies per nucleus. You're not going to expect that. At at um, this, so this is from muscle biopsy at day 60. There were at least four vector copies per nucleus, so four transgenes on average in a muscle biopsy. And at year two, it did dramatically decline. I forgot to tell you that there was one tragic event that happened. Um, one patient in the high-dose cohort actually died in a car accident at day 220. And, the, and that, was relate, that was thought to be unrelated to the study. So we are missing data from that one patient. And there is a dramatic decline in the vector copies per nucleus at year two muscle biopsy. Despite that, I want to show you that the amount of beta sarcoglycan on the Western blot at baseline was approximately 30%, a little higher than that. And then it increased to about approximately 60% at day 60. And it remained roughly at 60% at year two, a little bit right at 60% actually at year two. So despite this vector genome going down, the amount of beta cyclglycan on the Western blot is high at year two. That speaks to its durability. And in an, in an unrelated study, they demonstrated that if a patient can have, if a patient has less than 30% beta sarcoglycan on their muscle biopsy, that it actually correlates with a very high risk of loss of ambulation by 18 years of age in this specific limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So trying to keep it higher than 30 is the goal. And hopefully that will correlate with longer walking and then better lung function is what we're going to try to see over time. And here are the sarcoglycan, uh, beta sarcoglycan percent positive fibers. It went from very few positive fibers demonstrating beta sarcoglycan to approximately a 70%, and it dipped down slightly to about 65% percent, percent positive fibers in by year two. And the intensity also uh, similarly was elevated much more than baseline, and there's a slight decline between uh, two months and two years. These are the actual corresponding slides of immunofluorescence staining. Um, you can see that the edges of the muscle cell are nicely lit up with the dark red stain, which is staining for beta sarcoglycan, which wasn't present at baseline. And it remains positive at two years, speaking again to durability. And finally, what did this mean for the patient? They measured something called the NSAID, which is the North Star, um, North Star assessment in limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And at, <clears throat> at six months post, post um, gene therapy, the change from NSAID was about a three and a half point change. That is great because they normally decline at two year, at two points every year. And at one year, it's about a four point change. And there was a dramatic decline between year one and year two. So that's something to keep in mind. And um, as to why this is, it could be because it's only derived from three patients in the high dose cohort. Now, let me take you to the last, um, the last trial that is currently underway and wh how it's coming into play. So this is a, a treatment for FKRP, 2I, what was historically called, called 2I R9. And for this muscular dystrophy, they're giving something called Ribitol. Ribitol is an alcohol. It's actually a, when you reduce ribose sugar, you get Ribitol. Ribitol 5-phosphate is a functioning glycan, meaning it's like a polysaccharide that is, that is used to glycosylate alpha dystroglycan. And alpha dystroglycan is on the muscle membrane. And there are various enzymes, the ISPD, the Fucutin, FKRP, that are responsible for making Ribitol be able to glycosylate alpha dystroglycan. So Ribitol 5-phosphate binds CTP, which is basically an energy molecule similar to ATP, ISPD, which is isoprenoid synthase domaining containing enzyme, go ahead and makes it into CDP ribitol, which then uses two different enzymes to 
get ribitol 5-phosphate in tandem. So these are two sugars linked together, and that gets put onto alpha dystroglycan. And you need alpha dystroglycan to function normally in order to have a normal muscle membrane. And when you have mutations in this gene, this enzyme, or these two enzymes, you have lymph girdle muscular dystrophy. So the question is, if we can give the patient more ribitol, can we drive the reaction this way? And potentially, especially if, let's say it's FKRP, if you were to give a functioning version of this gene, and thus they have a functioning enzyme, you can potentially drive the reaction even better. To show this proof of concept, they actually tested it in mice with FKRP. FKRP dimerizes, which is why you have a large protein and a small protein, but untreated mice did not have any FKRP expression. Mice treated with Ribitol didn't really have that much of a difference compared to, compared to untreated. If an FKRP gene replacement therapy was given to the mice at a low dose, you're getting some FKRP gene, or rather protein expression, which is good. And then FKRP at low doses, the gene replacement given at low doses combined with Ribitol actually shows a slight improvement. And if FKRP gene replacement is given at a high dose, you see a dramatic improvement in FKRP gene expression, protein expression. And then if given with Ribitol, you actually have a dual effect. So giving this very simple alcohol molecule along with the gene replacement is potentially going to be in the works in the future. So true to form, um, they're first doing just Ribitol, just because it's easy to do as opposed to a gene therapy, in FKRP patients. That trial is currently underway. It's for 12 to 60-year-olds, and it's, a, it's randomized two to one, two to Ribitol for every one placebo patient. It's a three-year study. They're also measuring the NSAID. They're doing various other secondary performance uh, outcomes as well, and a biomarker assay. And this is a this shows you what the how limb girdle muscular dystrophy is looking like in the spectrum uh, in terms of what's coming down the pipeline. You can see that Sarepta and um, Atamayo um, are in the field trying to develop treatments for these types of diseases. And here are some resources that can be very helpful. There are some wonderful disease-specific patient advocacy groups, as well as the MDA that is much more disease agnostic, but has, a, has had a hand in limb girdle muscular dystrophy for a very long time. And there are some wonderful websites that I refer to often to help me with VUS or to get the, make sure I'm up to date on the clinical phenotype. And um, I often will refer patients to other clinicians for advanced testing or RNA sequencing on muscle, perhaps computer modeling um, to help me with VUS, re VUS resolution. That brings me to my end, to the end of my webinar, but